All right, so thanks everyone. Um, I'm a grad student at the University of Washington. I'm really honored to be here. Um, and I'm going to talk to you about some mathematical modeling work that Carl and I have done. Uh, and we're trying to understand how maladaptive levels of anxiety might result among some members of a population, even if everyone is behaving optimally. Oops, didn't mean to, didn't mean to advance. Um, yeah, so, so in other words, how can you get suboptimal behavior from an optimal strategy? All right, so for background, of course, anxiety, dis anxiety disorders are extremely common, um, and they can be very severe. They can really prevent uh, people from being able to function at all for periods during their lives. And we want to, uh, what we're interested in is really trying to explain why evolution has left, left us vulnerable to this kind of anxiety. Of course, so the first thing, of course, is to recognize that anxiety is, has a very useful function. Um, we, and, it's, and it is uh, plastic. So when you have more anxiety, you are more um, attuned to signs or cues of potential threats. And this is useful if you're in a more dangerous environment. Of course, this leads uh, to Randy's smoke detector principle. And uh, it says how um, because we're, we're dealing with costs versus benefits, and the cost of not paying attention to a signal of real danger and ignoring that can be extremely high, um, you have an asymmetry that arises. And so it might make sense for us to actually have a lot of anxiety. We might all, everybody in the population might have more anxiety than it feels like we would like to have. Oops. Um, okay, so that's, a really good fundamental explanation for why, there's so, why, there, why everyone in the population might have a lot of anxiety. But if we want to explain anxiety disorders, uh, we need um, something more. We need, we need something different. So one thing we'd like to explain about anxiety disorders is why it's only a subset of a population that experiences it. So of course, you know, a lot of this is going to have to do with genetics. But what we're interested in here is sort of the limits of what natural selection could produce. So, um, even under optimal behavior, what might occur. Another thing we'd like to um, understand about uh, anxiety disorders is sort of the self-reinforcing feedback loop um, that, that these disorders, the people with these disorders sort of get into. So the pessimism of being over, overly afraid uh, perpetuates itself. And then finally, if uh, the point of anxiety is to modulate our sensitivity to cues of potential danger, we need to consider how, um, how does that modulation actually work? So how do you learn uh, to regulate your, your level of anxiety based on previous experience? OK, so, so in order to, to get at that learning, um, there's two things that are actually that you need to learn about. So a simple example, uh, uh, you're a gazelle, and you need to avoid cheetahs, OK? Um, you need to do, in order to do that, you need to know two things. So you need to know how common are cheetahs, and then you also need to know what are the signs uh, of a cheetah, you know, potentially stalking you. Um, so you know, what, how loud are they? Um, what, you know, how should I set my signal detection threshold there? So um, I'm going to walk now. Describe um, the model that that we've uh, developed, uh, and I'm just going to walk through it using a simple toy example. So um, also, this is this. Is, so I'll, I'll talk about two models, and the first one is a very simple one drawn straight from behavioral ecology, um, and this one I'm just dealing with the first of those two questions. So learning about how prevalent dangers are in the environment. So we're going to set aside the issue of uh, how to set your signal detection threshold for the moment. So imagine a fo foraging fox. Uh, this fox has uh, several potential sources of food in its environment, but one of those uh, sources uh, are burrows it can decide to explore. Um, so one thing it might find uh, when it explores a burrow is lunch, so it might get a rabbit. Uh, but the burrows can also be dangerous to explore so it might find trouble. It might encounter a badger. Um, and, and this uh, you know, uh, implies a risk of injury. So it needs to decide whether uh, burrows are dangerous and then whether they're worth the risk of exploring. OK, so the fox um, also doesn't know. So it doesn't know whether how common badgers are. So 
Sorry, I'm not sure why it keeps advancing. Um, so in a good environment, badges are rare. In a bad environment, badges are common. And the fox needs to learn by experience by exploring the burrows which environment it's in. OK, so to analyze this model, it's a simple model. Uh, it's very straightforward if, uh, you only, if the fox is only going to explore one badger. It um, has some prior probability about how likely the world is to be bad. So it has a prior prob probability maybe half of the time foxes are in environments where badges are common, half of the time they're in environments where badges are rare. Um, that gets, gives it a probability of how likely it is to encounter a badger versus a rabbit, and then we can simply calculate um, the expected payoff for exploring a burrow, and, and it, uh, the optimal behavior is to explore when the expected payoff is positive, of course. Now, if the fox uh, samples repeatedly, um, so if it has many burrows that it's going to explore in its territory, um, now learning comes into play, and it needs to update its prior probability after exploring each burrow. But in addition to that, you also need to take into account the value of information. So even if it's, um, so what, what the fox is sort of facing is this uh, uh, exploration exploitation trade-off. Even if it is a little bit more likely that the fox is going to um, encounter a badger, it might be beneficial for it to explore just to gain information on the off chance that actually the environment is better than it thought. OK, so we can deal with this uh, by using a technique called dynamic programming, and we can just solve for what the optimal behavior is. So this is a depiction of uh, what the optimal uh, an optimal behavioral strategy. So uh, on the x-axis here, um, this is the time step um, that the individual fox is on. So it's going to encounter, in this example, uh, 30 burrows in total um, on the y-axis is its prior probability of uh, believing that it's in a bad environment versus a good environment. And then, so, the, and these are the two things it needs to consider, how many more burrows it has to explore, so how important information is, and uh, how, whoops, and how likely it is uh, to be in a bad environment. And that places it at some location in this plot, and if it's in the green location, it should go ahead and dig. If it's in, the, if it's in a white area, um, it's too risky and it should stop, and it's not useful enough to gain more information. Okay, so now um, I'm interested in what's going to happen in the entire population. So if we ha look at the entire population of these foxes, uh, what's, what's going to end up with their behavior? So we're looking at, okay, after um, all of the individuals have had the opportunity to explore um, their environment, what subjective beliefs do they end up with? So how have their probabilities been updated that they've been in a good environment versus a bad environment? So that's what's uh, on the x-axis here. Um, the their subjective prior probability that they're in a bad environment versus a good environment. And then uh, the y-axis is just frequency, so this is uh, basically a histogram. Um, and what we see is that uh, the vast majority of the population, when they're in a bad environment, so that's what this plot is for, um, that they get it right and their belief is they're more likely to be in a bad environment. However, because there's some stochasticity, um, a small portion of the population um, happened to get really lucky and encounter a lot of rabbits, even though that they were in an environment with a lot of badgers, and so they think they're in a good environment. They got it wrong. Okay, but now I'm gonna compare that with what happens in a good environment. And um, this is sort of the, the central point that, I'm, that I wanna get at is, Okay, in a good environment, what ends up happening is, again, most of them get it right. They believe that they're more likely to be in a good environment. But a much larger proportion of the population actually ends up getting it wrong. And so what's going on here is that there's an asymmetry involved in whether you continue to sample, continue to explore burrows, whether you think the environment's good or bad. Um, so this is a very different kind of asymmetry. It's not about cost versus benefits. It's about whether you should continue to learn about your environment or not. Um, so what's going on here is these are different traces. These are just examples of how uh, two individuals have updated their prior probabilities uh, that the world is bad versus good. This one has encountered more uh, rabbits than badgers. When it's a badger, it gets more likely that the the world is, is bad, but it encounters more badgers, uh, more rabbits rather, and keep on, keeps on sampling. 
This one encountered some badgers first off, and once it gets into this area, it stops sampling. All right, so um, that's uh, really interesting. Um, it's not really a model of anxiety yet, though, because it doesn't involve um, any cues, any, any um, sort of judgments about um, cues of potential danger. This is just how risky are burrows. So now we're going to um, extend the model uh, just by, in by including saying, OK, now let's say what if a fox can pick up some cues about its environment? What if it can um, listen beforehand um, at, the, at the interest of the burrow before it has to decide whether to explore it? Um, so this, the analogy is this could be any, um, any kind of cue about the environment. In this case, we're going to say uh, rabbits are quiet, badgers are noisy. So then to formalize this for the model, we have to uh, assume some, uh, uh, some relationship between the amount of noise that's coming from the burrow and the probability that there's a badger uh, present in that burrow. So actually for this model, what we're doing is we're just scaling, we're just arbitrarily scaling, okay, so there's noise, it goes from zero to one. Um, we're also gonna assume a uniform distribution uh, between zero and one in the amount of noise that's, that's coming from it. And when there's less noise, it's less likely that there's a badger in the burrow. This time, the, what distinguishes the good environment from the bad environment is how likely um, or, or what uh, determines um, whether that cue indicates danger or not. So in a good environment this time, because badgers are rare, it's only very loud noises that indicates that, that there's danger. But in a bad environment, because more badgers are more common, it's a, a larger range of noises that indicates that it's more likely that a badger will be present. Okay, again, um, we can analyze this uh, with dynamic programming and solve for what is actually the optimal behavior um, given any particular cue uh, and any prior probability. Okay, so now there's this extra dimension of uh, what cue you see at the burrow um, in addition to what's your prior probability. Um, so that's what's shown here. I think for, uh, I can get into that a little bit more, but I think for the interest of time, I'll, I'll move on and just, show that the results are very similar even when um, the uh, individual has information, uh, can gain information beforehand about whether it's gonna encounter danger. So here again, we're in the bad environment, um, and here's looking at the entire population, and the population has uh, almost, the entire population has correctly estimated that they're more likely to be in a bad environment when the environment is actually bad. When they're in a good environment, again, the majority gets it right, but again, uh, there's a large percentage of the population that gets it wrong because they got stuck um, after they got unlucky. So again, the root of the problem is that uh, even with optimal learning, um, you, uh, whether you should sample or not depends on your subjective probability about what the world is like, your subjective beliefs about the world. Um, and when the environment's thought to be bad, individuals will stop sampling. On the other hand, it doesn't happen the other way. So when the environment is thought to be good, um, the best thing to do is to keep sampling and you're gonna quickly learn to disconfirm your beliefs. Um, so there's some predictions from this model and, I'm, and I'd love to sort of um, hear about you know, uh, whether people uh, find these, these to be true, especially, uh, especially the second one. But so the predictions are a subset, it's a subset of the population this time, not the entire population, but just a subset will suffer from anxiety disorders in the sense that they have more fear um, or more likely to experience fear than uh, they should. And this is different from a mismatch explanation which would predict that the entire population uh, shifts. Um, being too afraid should be common, whereas being not afraid enough should be rarer. So I'm really interested in if, if people uh, find that to be true. And then also the model sort of nicely accounts for how exposure and response therapy can um, be, be an effective introduction. All right, uh, I'll stop there, thanks so much.